Hey, hey, it's your girl, Carla Renata, back for episode 27 of Black Tomatoes here at Black Hollywood Live. We got puppets. We got folks searching for people. We got some girls to support. Stay tuned. There's so much hey, to talk about. Girl. In case you don't know, that is Mr. Curtis Mayfield singing Pusha Man from the Superfly soundtrack. And we'll be talking to the cast members of the updated version of Superfly this year, 2018, a little later on. But right now, <laughs> how you doing, Scott? Good. How you doing, Carla? How was your week? Good. It was little, good? A little long. A little long? A little long. <laughs> little long but, what were you doing? Uh, how was your week so long? No, j- I don't know. Just like... It's the week before I leave for Toronto and Telluride, and it's just like all that build up, you know? It's just kind of like, okay, let's move it along. Let's move it I along. Know. Let's move it along. I'm right there with you. Yeah. I am right there with you. So I was remiss in saying I'm your host, Carla Renata. <laughs> <laughs> and my co host is Scott Menzel. Hey, hey, hey yes. Hey. And we are black. Yeah. We'll be back anyway. <laughs> so let's get right on into it. I loved this movie. I know that you, that you did not see it, but it is a 1973 film that was remade this year in 2018. And in 1973, it was with Steve McQueen and Dustin Hoffman, who were like the biggest stars of that, oh, that yeah. time. And so now it's been remade with Charlie Hunnam mm-hmm. and Rami Malek, and it's directed by Michael Knorr. And it was fantabulous. It really, really was. It's shot really beautifully. And um, Charlie Hunnam, he's such a hottie. He's so cute. So I did this roundtable interview where I spoke to Rami and... Carla, what? you have to tell them what it is. All right. Happy on. <laughs> <laughs> oh, see, I'm tired. See, I said I was tired, and now the cracks are starting to show. So the film is called Papillon, 1973 remake, Papillon. Yeah. So the stars of the film are Charlie Hunnam, Rami Malek, and the director is Michael Noor. And I sat at this roundtable interview, and and I interviewed them along with some other ladies, and we got some nice little little clips from it. So um, let's roll right into let's that and see what they got. See, see what Papillon's all about. Oh. Say that you were spot next to me. You've got a lot of eyes on you. I can keep you safe. All I need is enough money for an escape. Won't be cheap, but you'll be safe. Send the scorpion to the frog. All scorpions in here, pal. I think I'd be better off taking my chances sitting up in front of the guards. Wouldn't you agree? You seem like the kind of man who can make up his own mind. You're a good judge of character. Have a good night. Hey, hey, it's your girl, Carla Renata, a.k.a. the curvy film critic for Black Tomatoes here at Black Hollywood Live. Listen to what the stars had to say about working with each other, losing weight rapidly, working with their director, Michael Knorr, that infamous cliff scene and what it was like to shoot it. And listen to what Charlie Hunnam has to say about a documentary called Gladiator Day's Anatomy of a Prison. Take a listen. This seems to be a film about trust, about two men having to trust each other under really extraordinary circumstances. How did you two learn how to trust each other while filming this motion picture? You either like somebody or you don't. And a lot of that is built in just the experience of, you know, going out and having some dinners together and getting to know each other and some drinks and a walk around the city and, you know, just whether or not there's just a, an essence there between two people, you know? And that's why chemistry in all films is so unpredictable, because it's really just whether you like a motherfucker or not. <laughs> I like you, Charlie. Yeah. Straight to the point. I like that. What about you, Rami? I am have been such a fan of Michael. He has a very specific, unique form of storytelling, which I think inspires moment-to-moment creativity on the highest level, so spontaneous creativity, which is, I think, one of the things you hope you can get from any aspect of the process, hopefully your own, but when you don't have it in you, uh, or it can be cultivated, and he's one of the people who I've worked with 
that I think is really uniquely, specifically talented at that. That moment-to-moment spontaneity of having things that are, uh, I guess what people might call them happy accidents, happen on screen. That's a major asset to have as an actor. It's a challenge to lose that much weight that quickly. It comes with this duality of like quite a calm and a focus to it and an emotional consistency. But then also within that, there's the odd spike of emotional inconsistency. <laughs> but it's an, it is an interesting thing. I'm doing it again right now. I don't know why the fuck I've done this, but three times, three films <laughs> out of five, I've lost a lot of weight for them. Just I'm in the process, I lost like 25 pounds in the last five weeks and just starving myself again. This is the last time I'm going to do it. <laughs> is there a certain so, yeah. diet that you have to go on to do that, to drop weight that quickly? I, I tend to just go kind of vegan, but but the biggest thing for me is cutting out like the three white devils of sugar, dairy, and flour, mm-hmm. you know? No alcohol. <laughs> yeah, and that was the one thing that, you know, was, you know, there was a little bit of negotiation with on this project. <laughs> Just you know, he was like, he could, he could get you know, rid of the three were, white devils, but the alcohol. Yeah, I don't know. yeah, that one, that one slips by occasionally, you know. Michael, I'm particularly fascinated with how you shot the scene where Poppy jumps into the ocean to get on his raft. How did you shoot that? Did you shoot it in two different sections, him jumping? Was a stunt person used? Did Charlie do it? Like, I'm just fascinated by that. That was a long, <laughs> like, how many well, feet was that? So we shot the jump in itself and then the sequence in itself, but they were actually on the actual cliff. So everything is shot at the same place. Mm-hmm. So uh, so we felt that that was very important. But they're actually looking down. They're really looking down and getting the experience of how far it actually was. So there's no green screen in where they're looking uh, out. So they're That's actually what I was interested to know, because yeah. it no, looked so like it was actually standing on the cliff and trying to listen to uh, oh, where, his, where, where Papi is and, mm-hmm. and the other way around and Charlie's really in the water. Well, Charlie would take off and stop himself yeah. almost before it <laughs> <going>. Yeah. <laughs> And it was a little too oh close. Gosh. I don't want to. I don't want you to become a liability. <laughs> <laughs> this as an actor. I spent fourteen hours in a cell in Montreal Airport. So I did my time. Oh, really? I did my time. I'd been working all night, and I'd been up for twenty three hours. And this guy was giving me a hard time for no reason. So I said, "You want to do me a favor, pal? You want to lose the fucking attitude?" Oh. Uh, Got up and slapped his hand down on the counter and said, Boy, I will fuck you up. And I said, Bye. I was like, Welcome to fucking try. By the time I even got that out, I was already face down in the counter being fucking handcuffed. I was pretty big, but not as big as either of these two dudes. <laughs> not as big as the two dudes who arrested me. There's an amazing, amazing prison documentary called The Anatomy of a Prison. It's called Gladiator Days The Anatomy of a Prison Murderer. It's about this kid, Troy Cal. Goes into prison at 17 for life with no chance of parole goes in for murder so he's already you know he's just like a good kind of tough good guy and the decisions he makes within the first 18 months of his incarceration just set this trajectory of like into the heart of darkness he said you know what i'm not gonna like sell my body i'm not gonna do anyone's laundry you know i'm gonna spend here the rest of my life here the the, le- the least i can do to myself is like walk in a man and get carried out of that and like fuck it that might be a month or it might be the next 40 years but I'm just gonna hold the line and Jesus what is required of him to stay true to that oath that he makes to himself is just a real horror story but the alternative's not any better you know sorry Based on the little I know of incarceration, I would do everything possible not to put myself in that. (laughs) (laughs) I'm innocent, I'm innocent. (laughs) Most of the film is shot very darkly, except for the one time that you're outside in Devil's Island. Is that a conscious choice? It's very much also what the the, the film is about. Trying not only psychologically coming from darkness into light, but also visually. And uh, and I think uh, it was such an... interesting experience for me to try to convey a a love story which actually in many ways is a psychological trait because they start off making a trade-off I mean I'll be your bodyguard if you gave me your money and then the film shifts in trading off psychological attributes so to answer your question in a short way it says that it's light and darkness it's yin and yang it's it's female it's it's, it's male and there are not that many 
I mean, Eve Hewson gives a great portrayal of the, the female voice in the film. In many ways, we try to keep that tone throughout because even though there's no women, there's still like Jung, you know, the psychologist Jung, he says, uh, any man, any moose, the yin and yang, you know, it's always fighting against us. And you see how it shifts because Papi allows himself to be more feminine, like not literally, but be in, in more balance as the film progresses. And the guy goes into a darkness where you could say masculinity and where you could say Roland Miller represents the darkness of, of the masculinity. There's a lot of things I'm saying here which is not just relevant for what happens in front of the camera, but anyways, that's always what I said to the crew. I mean, you can't expect drama in front of the camera if you're not expecting drama behind the camera. That's it's a good point. It. Yeah, I mean, a good point. it's, yeah. uh, it's got to work both ways, and I kind of like that. There was a bit of a concern. I mean, this is going to be so heavy and so weighted at times, and, and that's what people do in those circumstances anyway. That's how we got through it, but that exists. I mean, you try to bring levity to, to those dire moments, and so... Yeah. We tried to, yeah, we tried to do that as much as possible without destroying the tone of it, shaking it up, I guess, a little bit. Thank you so much, Charlie Hunam, Rami Malek, and Michael Noor for sitting down and talking with Black Tomatoes here at Black Hollywood Live. Papillon, a remake of the 1973 hit with Steve McQueen and Dustin Hoffman, hits theaters on August 24th. This is your girl, Carla Renata, a.k.a. The Curvy Film Critic. Until the next time, love, peace, and hair grease. So that's it. There and you go. It, it Very was, good. It was great. It was a really good time. We I learned a lot about that scene, that infamous cliff scene. And when people see the movie, they'll see that. But it was really, it's a really good film. It's done exquisitely well. And I highly encourage everyone to check it out. I loved it. I loved the performances. I loved everything about it. And just to recap very briefly, it is a story about, it's a true story about this man who was framed for a murder that he didn't do which what else is new? Somebody's always framed for something. But he got framed for this murder that he didn't do and he ends up spending a lot of time in jail, like more time than he ever thought he would. And so he took his stories and made them into, and wrote them down into a journal and then he sold them to make them into a book and and the book was made into a motion picture. The the film did pretty well actually this weekend. It opened at about 500 theaters. I think it opened Mm -hmm. at about a million and a half. Yeah, which that's is not great. which is not too bad for mm-hmm. a movie that only opened in five hundred theaters. Yeah, I'm, so. I'm, but I'm telling you, their performances in this movie, don't sleep, don't sleep on Charlie Hunnam and Rami Malek and Papillon. Do not sleep. They should get Oscar nominations. They should. We should see them all over the awards circuit this coming season. So I'm looking forward to that. Moving forward, your favorite film. <laughs> <laughs> so this is the thing. I love Regina Hall. Okay. I think she is the most slept on movie star of color that's out there. She's got that all American, you know, sweet little girl face. We've seen her in lots of movies over the years. Uh, Best, um, I think it's uh, Best Man. Holiday? Best Man's Holiday? Best Man, oh no. She was in About Last Night, right? She was in About Last Night. She's been in a lot of she's movies. She's been in a lot of things, yes. like, There's so many, I can't even remember right. them to name them. But she's been in a lot of films, and she's always been like a very secondary character or not somebody that was integral to the story-making process, right? So um, it was the best best man. That's what it was. The original she was in, one. She was in the, the original, original best one. man, and she played Candy in that one because they played that song by Cameo called Candy. Yeah, yeah. Loved that. But anywho, I digress. She is the star of this movie, which she also was the star of Girls Trip, which was a big old hit last summer yes, for her. Yes. And they're going to do a sequel to that. That was announced this week that they're going to do a sequel to Girls Trip. So, yay, Regina, we can't wait to see you. But this summer, she's doing Support the Girls, where she plays Lisa. Lisa is the manager of a restaurant that's, for lack of a better way to say it, kind of like Hooters. Yep. And she, the title infuses the fact that she supports her girls. That's what it's about. I didn't particularly like this movie, but I love her. And that's pretty much all I have to say about that. (laughs) Uh, uh, So my story with this movie is that we, me, Scott Mance, and my wife, Ashley Menzel, we saw this movie right after we saw The Quiet Place at South by Southwest. We Mm -hmm. were on a really big high from Mm -hmm. that movie. We (laughs) went over to see the support the girls, uh, Friend, uh, one of our best friends, actually, who's a publicist, actually worked on this film and repped it. And we were so excited to see this movie because, like you, Regina Hall, I love her. Uh, Haley Lou Richardson, I also love oh, her. Yeah. I think she's very underrated and overlooked as an actress. Um, 
the movie i i be honest i can't remember much about it all i know is that's a bad thing it's it's very flat it's very boring uh regina hall tries all she can she does she she gives it the old college try but that script and the choppy direction and uh yeah it's it's a it's a mess it's dull it doesn't quite have the emotion you want from it no and i think what they were going for i think the script was supposed to infuse a a feeling of supporting the whole Me Too yes. movement because one of the characters in the film has an abusive boyfriend and Lisa is Lisa, aka Regina Hall, is trying to save her and goes through these painstaking processes of raising money to help her. Yeah just for her to do something else with the money other than help herself. So I think the message of the movie is their heart is in the right place, but it's just not executed very well. Yeah, I would have to agree with you. I just, there's there's all these scenes of togetherness in the movie, yet I didn't really feel like any of these characters really b belong together. Did you get that No, feel? I didn't, I didn't. I didn't feel a connection with any of the that's, characters. That's what I feel too. I didn't it's, feel like, missing. yeah, I didn't feel like any of them had a yeah they just didn't connect there was no it chemistry. felt like it felt like it was a movie with five different stories playing out and none of them connected to the other you right. know what i'm saying i agree with you that's what it felt like. yeah and oh. it just became tedious yeah so unfortunately you know here at black tomatoes we love miss regina hall <laughs> but that movie mm, not so much no not so much so this movie i know we both loved it is a breakout star role for john cho it is called searching it is about a man who has lost his wife. He has, they have one child between them and he's struggling terribly to keep his relationship alive with his daughter because his daughter was really tight with the mom. She taught her how to play piano and once the mom passed away, part of her passed away with the mother and in the relationship between the daughter and father started to suffer a little bit. In the process of that, the young lady ends up missing. And what's interesting about this film is that, and correct me if I'm wrong, I think this is the only movie to date where three quarters of the film is mostly done on a computer screen. Yeah, it's, right? it's one of the first of its kind. So the whole film is showing her father searching, literally searching for her on the computer, backtracking through her 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 digital footprint, so to speak, to see who her friends are, to see where she went and all of that. And then it takes a twist that you do not see coming. And like, I don't know about you, <laughs> but it gobsmacked me. Oh, I did yeah, not see yeah. that coming. I really didn't see that coming. And I don't want to say what it is because I don't want to ruin it for anybody. But I love John Cho in this movie. I loved Deborah Messing, Messing in yeah. this movie. Because this, I haven't seen her do anything like this. I've seen her do some cop roles on television, but they, they were okay. But her role in this, she's bringing it. I, I really enjoyed her. I enjoyed everything about this film, and I enjoyed the performances, and I enjoyed the fact that they took technology where we are right now and used that as a character in the impetus of telling the story. Oh, I, th this movie is fantastic. This yeah. is one of my favorite movies of the year. Um, John Cho kills it in this movie, and... You know, we've seen a few movies like Unfriended, Unfriended Dark Web, and there's been a couple other ones that are slipping my mind. Open Windows. There's been mm -hmm. a couple movies like this where they've been trying to tell a story through technology. And while I don't really hate those other movies, and I think this is the strongest of the bunch because it's done so effectively. It's and, done very well. And the story is good. See, the other movies where they lack is the story. The story is kind of weak. And this one, it, it was hooks really you strong. right away. Within yeah. the first five minutes, you're yeah. like on top of this movie. You're mm. into it. You feel this emotion towards this family. You root for them right from the beginning. You don't even really know them. But what's amazing about this is kind of it's almost like a trip through technology like mm -hmm. how 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 is advanced and evolved over the it's years it's amazing when you see it right when you think about where we started with the internet and browsing and all i was just saying this to somebody yeah. yesterday i was talking about how um a little while ago when i was um doing a show in town my nephew came to visit me and it was during that time where you had <laughs> 
where you had dial up internet. Oh, yeah. And if you didn't have two phone lines, nobody could call you unless you had like a cell phone. Or then remember when it used to disconnect if someone did? And yes. then you were like, oh. And then you had to get back on yeah. and it would take forever to get on because you'd hear all that, all that, Shh. all that noise. Dur, dur, that dur, 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 dur. You'd hear all yeah. of that in the process. So I was just saying to somebody, I'm like, that was like, maybe 10 or 15 years About ago 15 years that ago. wasn't that long ago no. look how far it's come in like the last 15 years where you don't have to use a phone <laughs> you can get on instantaneously you can hop on a signal anywhere as long as you have wi-fi capability even the cell phones have changed remember the cell phones were like flip phones oh yeah, yeah. everybody had a flip phone you remember could, when you texting, couldn't even do video well, remember when texting was the first thing you were like oh my god and they had oh, that little text, flip yeah. one with the, with the little keyboard <laughs> yes yeah. Yes, the court, it had a court. They called it a QWERTY keyboard, and what was it called? Uh, Two-way pages yeah. and all that. Child, please. I, I, well, that, that's what I, love. <laughs> I mean. The movie starts off, and it's like they they get their first computer, and you see it's like an old Windows computer. <laughs> you hear that sound like da dong, and it comes on into the screen. You know that green and yellow and whatever the rainbow color screensaver comes on, and then you see them registering the computer, and then. What I love about this film, I mean, there's so much that I love about this movie, but one of the things that I, I love is how the simplest thing is so effective in this movie. Uh, looking at photos, just, just him looking at all these photos or listening to something or, you know, and dragging that photo to the trash to the, can. How that much broke the, my heart. How much of Ooh, that emotion broke my heart. effect it has. That yeah. broke my heart. Let's take a, let's, sure. let's take a look and listen to the, the trailer very quickly, if we could, because it is just... <laughs> the. Everything that we're saying about this film is just all of that. Yeah. Here we go. I'm the detective assigned to your daughter's case. I need to know how everything unfolded. Understood. I think we're gonna go late, like, ugh, all night. One, after a study session, Margot didn't return home. Margot Kim, school has her marked as absent today. Two, she didn't attend school on Friday. My daughter is in a lesson with you right now. Margot canceled her classes six months ago. And three, she's been transferring funds for the last six months. We'll handle the ground investigation, but as a parent, you can help us with who your daughter talks to. Is that something you can do? Yes. See, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. How he, how he uses, how he has to use her, the computer and her Facebook account. This is, this film actually is a great tool for any parent that, because the kids nowadays, unlike us, we didn't have cell phones. We didn't have the internet. So we actually had to interact with each other. Kids nowadays are on their cell phones. They, talk, they don't talk to each other. They don't talk to their parents. So you don't necessarily know who all their friends are. Because back in the day, you knew who somebody's friends were because they would come by the house. Right. Yeah. They would come by the house. You would go to their house. It was a whole thing that doesn't happen so much now. So this is a great learning tool, I believe, for any parent out there who is trying to not keep tabs on your kid, but just be a little bit more present about where your child is. Because if something, heaven forbid, happens to your child, like what happens to Margot, you will know exactly what to do to try to figure out what's going on. Because John Cho's character does not, when they tell him, yeah, we've reached a dead end, he's like, mm, no, we haven't. I'm not giving up on my kid. Oh, I, I mean, that that point, I mean, this is, you know what this fits as a double feature, a perfect double feature, eighth grade. Because, oh, right. Because that one show, showcasing like the images of like teenagers online and kind of how like they're viewed upon, like how they, they try to reach out to find an audience mm -hmm. and try to get friendships. Mm -hmm. And this one, it's very eye opening at times because, you know, we always think we know our kids. Right. That's that's one of the thing the big things. But. Everyone has like their secret life online now. Mm -hmm. Everything's about like, oh, who's the Facebook friend? Like, oh, what's going on on this website? And as this movie goes on, you start seeing him investigating more and more. And it's like, who she's been talking to? Does she really have friends? Are these people who she says are her friends, are they really her friends? Not really. And I think yeah. it's like watching those two movies this year and this summer. I mean, they came out like a month apart. Exactly. They really kind of do a great justice to showing how much parents should be paying attention to technology absolutely and what their kids are doing absolutely and uh i just thought this was this is just fantastic i i will also say that what's what's so great about this movie is that both deborah messing 
and also John Cho have not done movies like this before. No. Th these are very unique performances Absolutely. from them and career best, Absolutely. If, if I can say. Absolutely. I totally agree with you. Moving to the Happy Time Murders. <laughs> <laughs> now, I personally enjoyed the Happy Time Murders because... As some people listening or watching may know, I have a very strong history with puppets. Yes. <laughs> I was in The Lion King and dealt with puppets there, and I was in Avenue Q, and although I didn't operate puppets in Avenue Q, Avenue Q was a was considered a puppet show for um, adults, for all much. practical yeah. purposes. Yeah. But the one thing, and this is why I like the Happy Time Murders, because it reminds me of the drama that we would go through at Avenue Q. I would see people bring their children in to see the show at Avenue Q, and because the poster had Muppet-like puppets on it, they thought it was a kid-friendly show, and it was not. It was like Sesame Street on steroids for adults. That's what it was. And that's kind of what the Happy Time Murders is. As a matter of fact, their slogan is all Sesame no, is it? No yeah. Sesame, no all, Sesame street. all Street. Mm -hmm. And that's pretty much what it is. But I, it made me laugh out loud. Ah, Carla. It did. Wait, wait, wait. Let's, let's, show, let's show the trailer before, before you throw acid rain on it. Let's just show the trailer real quick. I'll suck your dick. Well, it's a great price. It almost makes me wish I had a dick for you to suck. What dick? That is a yes. <laughs> Two of the most decorated offices in this department. What do you see? Looks like a robbery gone wrong to me. This wasn't a robbery, this was a hit. What the? Someone out there <gasps> is killing puppets. Hey, handsome. You looking for some rotten cotton? I'm a woman. That's okay. Yeah, that's even got a good time for you. <laughs> We're gonna catch the bastards who did these murders. <laughs> Carla. <laughs> Carla. You're one of the best damn cops I've ever seen. I'll have your badge for this. I'm in the fucking FBI. Oh, yeah? What's that stand for? Fucking big idiots? <laughs> okay. I love this. I know you. I, I know you. I, 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 Listen. <laughs> I Listen, I my am jaws a, are hurting, I am, it makes I, me laugh so hard. It's I so am, stupid. I am a fan of all things Muppets and Puppets. But this movie, I mean, you watch that trailer, you see most of this movie. <laughs> That's the problem with this movie, is that you see all the gags that they just keep throwing at you repeatedly throughout this movie. And I the, the worst part about this movie, for me at least, was that... I liked the fact that they were cursing. I liked the whole violence aspect of this movie. Let me tell you, the favorite part was that ejaculation sh scene. Uh, that made me laugh out It's in the trailer. Loud. It ruins it. It's in the trailer. But you don't see it. But you don't. Sure you do. No, I didn't see it in the trailer. Oh, well, I saw it. The, in trailer, the trailer that I saw, I didn't oh, see okay. it. Oh, okay. The trailer that I saw, I saw the the puppet up against the glass, and then I saw Maya Rudolph's character bring the the, the Windex out. Yeah, yeah, but that's all I saw. Oh yeah, no, they sh one of the trailers that I saw. I don't remember when it, when it was, but it shows the whole thing. I love it, and let's just talk about the fact. I'm really not happy about people throwing acid rain on Melissa McCarthy's parade. I, listen, I agree with you. We were we talked about this earlier in the year. I mean, Life of the Party, I thought was fantastic. I think, you know, I think all, first of all, let's just say this. This is a female comedian who is producing, writing, and starring in her own films. Nobody else is doing that but her. And every time she has one that comes out, instead of acknowledging the fact that she's a powerhouse in that regard, what do they do? They talk about how horrible the movies are. I just, that's so annoying to me. They don't do, how many, how many men come out with movies that suck, that produce movies, star in them and write them and they suck and they don't do that to them. Why are they doing this to Mel Melissa McCarthy? It's I, annoying. There is a really, I mean, one thing I will say it's is that there, there is a massive dislike for Melissa McCarthy. And I don't know why there is a massive dislike for Melissa McCarthy, but it definitely exists. And I feel bad for her because I do think she's very talented and I do think she's very funny. Um, this movie, though, for me, I just I felt like this was too much of her doing like the same thing. Like at least in Life of the Party, I feel like it was building off of that, you know, the fact that she was involved with producing and writing with that one you can feel like the heart and soul of this this one was just a bunch of bad jokes that just that they just kept going and i know you liked it and that's what I that's did. the best thing about about humor is right like some people go some see people something get it, and some they love people it don't. but i some also like don't. the fact that that 
instead of Brian Henson, who's Jim Henson's son, yes. instead of him licen licensing the puppets out for somebody else to do whatever they wanted to do with it, he was actively involved in the movie. Like he, I believe he directed he the did. movie and he produced it as well. So I like the fact that he got involved in that process and didn't let somebody else take that legacy and do something crazy with it. But he did flip it on his ear because Jim Henson would have never did this with them puppets. I'm just saying. No, it's it's very strange watching this movie because, like, well, what I was going to say is that I adore the storyline of the murder mystery here. I actually really like the main puppet, Phil. I mm -hmm. thought he was great. Um, the chemistry between him and Melissa McCarthy was good. I love how they built up his storyline. But there was just there the raunchiness was just it was too in your face and too relentless to for me like i just felt and then i felt like halfway through and i think a couple of people have said this who i've talked to about halfway through it just felt like they ran out of jokes and then they only had to they only had the story to left and it, it just wasn't strong enough to push it over the edge like it just it felt dated it, it didn't feel edgy enough it, it's really weird like it's a, it's a mixed bag okay. I, I i said i said to in my review of this movie is that a lot of people said this is one of the worst movies of the year. I completely disagree with that. I think it's one of the the biggest disappointments of the year for me. Okay, well, we will agree to disagree because <laughs> I loved it. I laughed so hard. All right, so we have decided collectively yes. that we will add two segments to the show. So we are going to continue in that theme this week and talk about the 76th anniversary of Casablanca. It's such a classic. I know. I, I love Casablanca. Adore. Love it, love it, love it. But I also found some tidbits about it that I didn't know. So, again, I said it's the 76th anniversary. I did not know it was originally known as Everybody Comes to Rick's. That was the original I did title. Either. I didn't either. I also assumed that Bogart and Bergman won Oscars. They did not. Bergman wasn't even nominated. Claude Rains and Humphrey Bogart were nominated, but they did not win. It actually won three Oscars for Best Screenplay, Director, and Best Picture. Didn't know that. I also did not know, <laughs> this blew my mind when I saw this. So I did not know that the film was mostly shot in Arizona, different parts of Arizona, Tucson, Flagstaff, and some other part of Arizona, on, and at stage 11 and 12 at Warner Brothers Studio. But what really freaked me out is that I live directly behind the Van Nuys Airport, yes. and all of the airport yes. scenes in yes. Casablanca, I they did, shot I at that airport. That. Yeah. And I was like, what? What? I'm around the corner from history and didn't know it? I was very excited to know that. Very excited to know that. And the fact that it's in Van Nuys. <laughs> it's in Van Nuys. I'm like, wow, it's not, it's not in that country? That yeah, was yeah. really funny. Yeah. And then I also found out that the producer, Hal B. Wallace, almost made Sam a female. Did you know that? No. So Sam was almost a female, and Hazel Scott, who was a very popular black female pianist, her, Lena Horne, and Ella Fitzgerald were considered to be Sam. Wow. Isn't that amazing? That's amazing. Yeah. And... Last but not least, Dooley Wilson, who was Sam, was actually a professional drummer who faked playing the piano in the movie. <laughs> I thought that was hilarious. The person that was actually playing the piano was Jean Vincent Plummer. So he was faking playing the piano to Jean Vincent Plummer. Wow. I thought all of those things were very fascinating, but I just wanted to give a big ups to Casablanca. You got your film struck history right here on Black Tomatoes. Right? <laughs> <laughs> I know, me, me being at TCM yeah, was good for something. <laughs> and um, I also wanted to give a shout out to a film that's coming, that's coming out, that's already out on Netflix talk called To All the Boys I've Loved Before. It is based on Jenny Han's best-selling book. And it's kind of, it's like a really cute teen romance with an Asian female lead, a Korean American lead. So I kind of love that. Her name is Lana Condor and she plays L Lara, Lara Jean Kobe. So if you guys have not seen that on Netflix, check that out to all the boys I've learned, I've loved rather, I've loved before um, <laughs> on Netflix. I'm a hot mess. Then I wanted to give a shout out to um, some people that passed away because it was a lot of them this week. Yeah, I we know. We didn't talk about Aretha Franklin, so no. uh, rest in peace to Aretha Franklin. She passed away from pancreatic cancer. Neil Simon died this morning. That I mean, that's devastating. Yeah. I mean, Odd Couple, I mean, his stage yeah, plays. Yeah, Odd Couple, I mean, The Goodbye Girl, Lost in Yonkers. I mean, we could Barefoot go on and on park, and on. Uh, Barefoot in the Park. Yes. Oh, my God, I yes. used to watch that on repeat. We could go on and on. Yeah. So uh, he passed away from pneumonia, of all things. Um, Robin Leach passed away yesterday. Champagne wishes and caviar <laughs> dreams. Mr. Robin Leach, the lifestyles of the rich and famous. I'm actually going to miss him. He was a nice man. 
Um, Senator John McCain passed away from brain cancer. That was that was a little heartbreaking too. I didn't always agree with his beliefs, but he was a good egg, and I respected his opinions. Yeah, I mean, I, that clip has went around the internet the last couple of days of him talking to people at a rally and some woman coming up to him about Obama. Exactly. I heard he's a Muslim, and, and he, he said off. stop, and he said no, he no, 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 we just disagree. I'm like, I gotta respect him for yeah. that. So rest in peace and and much. Much, mucho, mucho, mucho prayers she, she, she. and love to his his daughter, Megan, and his, his wife. Um, Craig Zayden, who was the producer of Footloose and Hairspray, he passed away. And, of course, uh, Charlotte Ray from The Facts of Life, who played... This is our... going to be a very long uh, Oscars in memoriam know, again this year. I know. Our beloved Mrs. Garrett from The Facts of Life, she passed away. So, I have one more interview that I want to uh, play for you guys. Superfly was out early this year. We reviewed it here on Black Tomatoes. Um, Scott and I, and this past week, I had an opportunity to speak with Trevor Jackson, Andrea Londo, and Lex Scott Davis, who are stars in that film, to celebrate the DVD Blu-ray release of the film this coming Tuesday, August 28th. So here we go. Andrea Londo, Lex Scott Davis. And you're watching and listening to Black Tomatoes on Black Hollywood Live. Live. Yes! Woo! Woo! Instead of black exploitation, we're having a black exploitation mm -hmm. right now with I'm Sorry to Bother You, Black Klansmen. Hate You Give. The Hate You Give is coming out. Blind Spotting, all these films are coming out. Crazy Rich Asians, mm -hmm. and they're really turning. I gotta see that. I can't wait to I see, see that. I gotta see that. It's that. really good, y'all. But it's really turning the movie industry on its head because instead of our stories being told by other people, they're being told by, by us. us. Yeah. So I wanted to know how you guys feel about that and what you'd like to see, what kind of stories you'd like to see about us in the future. I, I love how how, like a lot of movies are showing like what's what's wrong with this culture when it comes to being like a black person but I would love to see a movie that's just like a story about a normal guy who just goes through normal things you know I feel like it always has to be like uh, whether it be a slave movie or like a struggle or something like that I would love to see a guy who's just like a lawyer and maybe he's just like you know has some wife issues or you know just I feel like human struggles and I think um, that's kind of what would bridge the gap I feel like sometimes we had that with Roman Esquire with Denzel remember that yeah, Philadelphia no 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 Roman Esquire, Roman Esquire. Oh, played, oh oh yeah yeah, yeah. Lawyer. He yeah. Was a lawyer that was he was like a savant so yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah so yeah. Yeah. yeah I love it things like that but I mean I love all of it as long as it's told well but I don't think it always has to be about oh, the, you know. yeah I agree I agree with that sorry were you gonna say something like this? yeah no, just because I think it's great that, you know, like people take their own power and start telling their own stories and start getting their name out there and, you know, everything that they want to create, that's great. But at the same time, I do think that there needs to be more, like, you know, it doesn't have to be a, like an Asian movie. It doesn't have to be a black movie. It doesn't have to be a Latino movie. Like, that's fine and that's great and valid and it can totally keep happening. But I think true, like, step forward. Is you want to see more diversity just, with all just races. Just inclusion. You know yeah. what I mean? Like, like some Sometimes, like, you see stories getting told about, like, what he was saying, a lawyer, a husband with issues, like, a couple, their kid dies, whatever. And I feel like there shouldn't be a point of making any of these actors any ethnicity because that's not America mm -hmm. and that's not the world in general. And I feel like that's still something that needs to be worked on, you but know? really get seen if we're talking about that or people only respect it if we're talking about that, you know what I'm saying? Most definitely, I do. It's like, you know, I hate to go back because this is a while ago, but like, even like the help and like all these things, those are the only time you get an Oscar look is when it's about, oh, what thing did you have to go through? And it's like, yeah, people should know that story, but it's like, that's the only time it recognizes when we feel like we're like the lesser of the two, well, you feel me? to your point, um, Octavia Spencer, who was also in the help, she did get nominated for Hidden Figures, and yeah. that was a story about female was actors. A female, right but still, it was this the struggle of them being black, and the yes. way they could do it was, you know I what I'm see. saying? So you're it's saying, like can we see something without the struggle happening? Yeah, that, I mean, the yeah. struggle's real, but okay. that's, oh, but that's not who we are, even though we had to struggle we overcame the struggle, mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying? There's but other stories that can be told. Yeah. I but agree this, yeah, with both of you, you were saying for sure, wholeheartedly, mm -hmm. and when you brought up Sorry to Bother You, it actually, it jumped out because it actually does and supports everything that we're actually saying, because unlike those other films, Boots Riley really took a moment to just tell a cool story that was relatable on so many levels, not just because the main character was black. Like you said, it wasn't a it wasn't a color-based movie. It was an inclusive movie about this telemarketing world. It was really weird and wacky and cool, but also had a lot of um, subliminal meaning behind it. So that was one that actually excited me about where the film industry is going, because I think mm -hmm. a lot of people recognize exactly what they're saying, yeah. and they're trying to figure out 
about how to be innovative and steer in a different direction. Absolutely. So I'm going to take us in a different direction right now. All right. (laughs) And let's swing back around and end with something about the film. So it's coming out on DVD. What is the one thing you want people to take away from Superfly when after they see it? If they didn't have a chance to see it in the theaters, they're not going to, you know, have the DVD or they're going to stream it via a streaming service. What is the one thing you want people to really pay attention to when they see this film? Uh, I think um, my favorite thing is the unity amongst black men. I feel like me and Jason's relationship really speaks volumes to how I feel like the world should be. I think it's hard for a lot of black men, especially just to like give love and like feel like they can do it together. It's always like, there's only so few spots, so I gotta beat you and I gotta be better than you. And it's like, there's not a lot of, but I feel like this film, Priest can do anything without him. And it actually without the women too. I think the women were represented very well in the film too. And just a more leadership light instead of following the man, they're kind of even the man instruction and kind of you know showing that support system but yeah i definitely think the unity amongst amongst men is hard we've seen all these videos and we kill each other it's like why i know <laughs> it drives me nuts i know yeah. ladies i think what i love about the choice made by the writer alex the fact that priest they decided for this new superfly to have a younger priest who does not use drugs and who does not use weapons I think that's something very key to take out and I don't know if a lot of people noticed it actually so that's why I'm stating it now because you get to see a young man, um, not just a young black man, but a young man still in a position of power but he's realizing and understanding that all of those ways that the people who are working in that same realm are not conducive for him to become a better man and um, something that can have longevity in a real future and making the choice not to kill with armed weapons is is massive especially in media and as well as drug abuse because we hear about that all the time and i know our original priest he you know did his thing with the (laughs) the cocaine but i love that we made a strong choice to not have him be seen in that way and closing it out what's your favorite one that reminds you of superfly I think Push Your Man. Yeah, Push Your Man. When I got the role, a friend of mine was like, listen to Push Your Man. Listen to it now. I was like, okay. A little Curtis Mayfield never hurt nobody. Thank you, ladies and gents. Oh, that was that. I enjoyed talking to them. Thank you so much, Lex Scott Davis, Andrea Londo, and Trevor Scott Trevor Scott Jackson. Why am I calling him Trevor Scott Jackson? Trevor Jackson. Because this is the thing. So I was saying this to you off off the mic yeah. that I knew who Trevor was because he was little Simba in The Lion King and I had played Shinzi in The Lion King so I was like yay one of the Lion King alumni is in a movie and, and I want to just say that I agree so much with Flex Scott Davis about about what she said mm-hmm. you know um, right now we're in this this renaissance where we're seeing a lot of um, diversity in film mm-hmm. but it, it is very much a story either of struggle or or all about like one race it's it's very limited where we see something that's just about people existing in a world i agree and um you know we saw it a little bit in searching we've seen a little bit in dog days but i think that's the natural progression that we need to get at where where they look at something like this movie that's coming out with octavia Mm. that she's starring alongside jessica chastain Mm. and just like having that as a natural chemistry you know, and then yeah. throwing someone else in there. Well, that's the world that we live in. Right. The world that we live in is very diverse. I mean, in, there are lots of races that have mixed. So there are a lot of people of mixed race running around, you know, the world. So it's going to eventually get to a point. I'm sure it's not going to take us long to get no. there. But we'll eventually get to a point where you won't have to say it's a black movie or a Latino movie or an Asian movie. It'll just be a movie. Yes. You know what I mean? And I'm really hoping we get there sooner than later because I, for one, am... I'm exhausted at that. I'm exhausted at the fact that we have to constantly separate the races when it comes to arts. It's art. It should be there for everybody, and there shouldn't be any type of label placed on it anywhere. And if I can say something, too. um, Knock yourself out. (laughs) I also also just – this is just a general statement. I I hate it that even in the press circle that they do that with us. Like they try to – figure out like, oh, who's going to like this movie? Who's this movie for? Let's just assign these people to this movie. Yeah, That really bothers me. Because, it's getting better, but, but it's not yeah. getting better quick, quick enough. No. Like I was complaining not too long ago about the fact that when Ocean's 8 came out, 
I wasn't even invited to cover that. Not only am I a woman, but I'm a black woman and there are black people in that film. Like for real though, like it was Ocean's 8. It's a film about women. Why was I not given that invitation? And I wasn't the only one, like a bunch of women were complaining about that. Black, white, otherwise, they were all complaining about the, how they didn't get an invite to that. Oh, and I, there's a couple of people, and I won't mention them by name, but there's a couple of people who I know of, of you know, black, black people at Junkets. And um, we, we, we laugh and we share stories. And one of, the, one of the, the main gentlemen, you know, said that whenever a movie comes out, uh, let's say Mission Impossible, uh, they say, can I talk to Tom Cruise? No. Can I talk to Rebecca Ferguson? No. You want to talk to Ving Rhames? Well, let's yep. talk to Ving Rhames. Yeah, they did and, that. And, and then, I think they, that's and, really messed up. Yeah, they do that. They When a film, like um, when American Assassin came out, I asked, could I speak to Michael Keaton? They were like, no, but do you want to talk to Sanaa Lathan? <laughs> you know, <laughs> like, no, I want so to talk what? to Michael Keaton. So what? I'm gonna have, so I'm going to have yeah. different questions for yeah. Sanaa Lathan than I'm going to have for Michael Keaton. Like, come on. Yeah. It's just, it's annoying and it's insulting. It yeah. really is. It's quite insulting, but hopefully that will change. So, Tomato meter. I know you didn't see Papillon, but I'm giving Papillon a five. Okay. <laughs> um, happy Time Murders. Two and a half. I give it four because okay. I liked Happy Time Murders. <laughs> um, what was the other one? Searching. Searching, five. Five. <laughs> cool. I think that was all of them. Uh, support, support the girls. Oh, uh, Because I like <laughs> Regina Hall, I'll give it a three. That's nice of you, Carl. <laughs> I'm, I'm giving it a one. Oh, man. Yeah, really? A one? one? I love Regina Hall, too. But here's the thing is, is that it's not against her. You know, I support her movies. I support her career. But it's just like I can't. You can't give this support a, the girls. I can't support the girls <laughs> in that movie because, oh, my. Oh, my no, goodness. Okay. No. And I'm done with that director. I, I don't know. Who that The director also did another movie, and I don't remember the name of it, but he did it with the girl who was on How I Met Your Mother, mm -hmm. who's also in the Marvel movies, mm -hmm. and Guy Pearce. And I can't remember what the name of it was, but I remember watching that movie at Sundance, and I was like, this is bad. And then I saw this one. It's the same director. And I'm like, okay, I think you're, I'm done with this guy. You're officially done? I'm, I think I'm done. Okay. Yeah. Well, I know next week you'll be on your way to Telluride, yes, right? And yes. then right after that, you'll be at Toronto where I'll join With you at you, Toronto. Yes. So we will not see you next so week. Do you want to tell them that we're going to actually do some stuff remotely? Yes, so we're, but not next week, week after next. So this will be the week of September 4th. We're going to do some remote stuff from Toronto, Scott and I for Black Tomatoes. So be on the lookout for that. Next week, I'm going to have somebody here with me. I'm not quite sure who that's going <laughs> to be, but it'll be somebody. And next week, we will, we will be talking about Operation Finale and Ken. So there's that. And I have an interview that I'm doing with uh, one of the stars from Ken, which is produced by Michael B. Jordan. We'll have Miles, one of the leads from that. And he's probably going to be on an interview at Popcorn Talk. So, oh, very nice. Very yeah. nice. So check that out. Um, you can always find me across all social media platforms at The Curvy Critic. You can also find me here every Sunday, 5 o'clock on Black Tomatoes here at Black Hollywood Live. Go to iTunes. Give us five-star rating. Give us some comments there. You can always comment and chat with us in the chat room at YouTube and subscribe to our YouTube channel. And work. Oh, and you can also find me right after this at The GH Report on After Buzz TV. And where can we find you, Scott? It's, it's doesn't the list just seem like it just keeps it getting keeps longer, longer, and and longer, longer and longer and <laughs> longer. I mean, every time I do this now, it's like, oh, okay. Well, first and foremost, I am the founder, main journalist for We Live Entertainment. I do a lot of written reviews and interviews. Make sure you go there over the next couple of weeks because every day, I guarantee you, I'll have something or Ashley Menzel will have something. But there will be something coming out almost every day for the next three weeks. So Toronto coverage and Telluride coverage is going over there. Uh, what else? You can find me on Twitter. You can find me on Instagram, the other Scott M. I do this wonderful show with this wonderful woman right next to me every Sunday at Black Hollywood Live. I do Meet the Movie Press, which is a movie news show. And we do reviews now, too. So we're like, we talk about stuff. Uh, that is on Fridays at 9 a.m. on the Popcorn Talk Network. And then Carla, who also comes on this show from time to time. And it's a great uh, organizational show because we support the LA Online Film Critics. And that is LA OFCS Weekly, 11 a.m. Fridays on the Popcorn Talk Network. Ooh, I almost forgot, you guys. During the month of September, 
<laughs> I know it's all it's never ending the, the announcements during the month of September you can find yours truly doing a segment on musicals there you the go. black experience on film which is sponsored by AFCA the African American Film Critics Association we are doing a month long series at Turner Classic Movies on the black experience on film so check my segment out on September 18th but support the whole series which begins on September 4th every Tuesday and Thursday so now that Scott and I have gotten all of our all of our announcements out of the way it is time to say goodbye <laughs> scott will see you in two weeks i will see you next week thank you for joining us and until the next time love peace and hair grease deuces from executives kevin undergaro dario Kristen, tiana hobson and the entire bhl staff we would like to thank you for supporting black hollywood live the first online broadcast network dedicated to african-american entertainment for questions and comments contact us info at blackhollywoodlive.com like us on facebook tweet us or instagram us at bhl online and i am the official voice of black hollywood live scipio instagram me at king xo bay thanks for tuning in hollywood redefined the views expressed here are those of the host only and do not necessarily reflect the views of bhl or its owners or principals